This is Rust in Production, a podcast about companies who use Rust to shape the future of infrastructure. My name is Matthias Endler from Corrode, and today we are talking to Mika Wild from Arroyo about how they simplified stream processing for data engineers with Rust. Mika, welcome to the show. Can you tell us a few words about yourself and Arroyo, the company you founded? Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so I am uh, a Rust engineer and the creator of the Arroyo streaming engine. So Arroyo is a real-time data processing engine that allows you to write SQL queries with Rust uh, user-defined functions on top of streaming data. For example, data you might have in Kafka or another streaming system. And I, I come to that problem and company after spending five years leading streaming teams at companies like Splunk and Lyft, which is a, a rideshare company in the US. And more probably, I've been in the big data space working on data systems for pretty much my entire career, starting out in ad tech, working on real-time ad bidding systems, and then leading data teams and building data systems. So yeah, that's, that's a, a brief background about me. At Splunk, you were a principal engineer and you were the team lead of the streaming compute team. So that makes you somewhat of an expert in stream processing, I would say. Maybe for the uninitiated, could you give us a just very quick, very brief introduction of what stream processing is in your own words? Yeah, so traditionally when people have wanted to process data, we do it in what's called batch mode, which means you take all the data in through whatever data sources those are, whether it's coming from logs you're reading from API requests that are, are ending up somewhere or wherever that data is coming, it all kind of filters through your system and eventually lands in traditionally a database or today maybe like a data lake or a data warehouse. And then once all the data is there, you run a really big data processing job on top of all of that rest, that, that data at rest. And often this means you wait you know, an hour or a day for all that data to land before you can kind of analyze it or, or learn anything about it. Stream processing, in contrast, does this data processing as the data actually arrives in your system, so in real time. And the advantage is there, obviously, latency is much better. You can process the data within milliseconds or seconds instead of waiting hours or days. But it also can give you a much kind of easier way to build these like end-to-end -end data systems where you need to consider like different properties around like timeliness and completeness in order to kind of build your higher level analytics or, or data products. And for kind of real-time companies like at Lyft, this becomes really crucial to be able to basically know things about your, your world really quickly. In Rideshare, you need to understand kind of where your users are, where your drivers are. You need to understand traffic speeds in order to do routing. You need to be able to do like dynamic pricing based on supply and demand. And, and all of this stuff really demands that you be able to do complex analysis on data really quickly instead of waiting, you know, a day for it all to land in your, in your data warehouse. So that's, that's kind of like a high level of the, the problem stream processing and solving or kind of how it fits yeah, so stream processing has existed before. There were other companies that did a lot of groundwork. You mentioned at some point Hadoop. You mentioned BigQuery in, mm -hmm. in your seminal article, that which we will get to in a second. But I think maybe you can just quickly explain what makes Arroyo special in this case and also what the competitors are lacking right now that maybe – is a nice niche for Arroyo. Yeah, so uh, well, so BigQuery and Hadoop are both kind of like in that batch paradigm where you let all the data collect and then you do a, a big data processing job over that data at rest. Uh, in the streaming world, traditionally, the, the most popular system has been one called Apache Flink. This is about a decade old, but it was really the first system that found a good programming model for streaming and really, uh, I would say, made it work at a level of correctness that 
that allowed it to be applied to a lot of these problems. Before Flink, we really had very simple systems that were couldn't couldn't really guarantee anything about correctness or completeness, and were were sort of just orchestration systems around your own logic. So, I I spent my year my career in streaming working on Flink, and and I think that's true of most of the other people who are kind of doing new things now. And for all of us, we're kind of have this perspective on Flink that it it solves this problem really well for people who are able to invest a ton of energy into becoming experts in Flink. So at the companies I've worked for, that meant staffing up teams that were 10 to 30 people uh, full of people working on Flink, building infrastructure and tooling around it, and then especially supporting end users who were actually building these streaming pipelines. And I think, well, Flink was really successful allowing sophisticated companies to roll out this technology in a way that would have been dramatically harder a few years earlier. It never really got to that point of of ease of use where you could hand Flink off to a data scientist, to a data engineer or a a product engineer and allow them to be successful building these real-time pipelines on their own. We we always needed a a lot of hands-on support from the the Flink experts at the company. And that's really what we're trying to innovate around in Arroyo. We're trying to build a system that is easy enough for any engineer or data scientist at your company to kind of pick up and build these correct, reliable, performant, real-time data pipelines. How do you see the relationship between stream processing on one end and these new workflow engines that pop up nowadays like Windmill, which is coincidentally also written in Rust, do you see an overlap? Do you see the industry converge to something that maybe encompasses both? Or would you say these are fundamentally different areas of expertise? Yeah, I think they're very different systems and they they are good at different kinds of problems. So workflow engines are really excellent at these like very long running tasks. Like we have a we have a a bunch of things we need to do based on fairly simple criteria over the course of a day. For example, a user signs up, we need to send them this email. Depending on what they do in response to that, we need to do this other sequence of events. And that's the sort of thing actually streaming engines like Flink or Arroyo are are pretty bad at. It's hard to specify that, that type of logic, that kind of conditional logic over all of these different states. And they also architecturally are kind of a way overpowered to do that kind of stuff. I think these systems actually work together quite well because streaming systems, stream processors are, are really good at data oriented problems. So often this will mean you put your like really big feed of data, your millions of events per second feed into your streaming engine. And that produces features or events that can then be consumed by the much lower scale workflow system. So that that's actually a pretty common pattern for these to to kind of work together. But at least in the near future, I don't see them as being kind of in the same space at all. Mm-hmm. On your website, you have a very nice example where you take a Kafka stream and then you write some, I think it's SQL, m- might be Apache Arrow or some other syntax, but it's similar to SQL to pipe events through your system and then see the results in real time. Mm-hmm. And this was pretty impressive demo. Mm. So is Apache Arrow SQL like or is it more than that? Is it different in in if so, in what sense? So the main way you program Arroyo is through SQL. We have slightly our own dialect, but it's we aim to be pretty Postgres compatible to to do real-time SQL, you do need to extend it in some way. There's different approaches for this, but SQL, as originally defined, was really designed for these batch computations to do like a, a group by or an aggregate or a join. You really need all of the data to be available. Otherwise, how do you know, you know, in a join, there might be more data coming in on one side or the other in the future, so you can't ever return that result. Um, so different streaming systems that use SQL have come up with different answers for basically how can we decide that we're done, we're able to to return a result for these expressions. In Arroyo, that looks like we we introduce 
these time oriented window functions. You have like a, a tumbling window and a sliding window and a session window. And these rely on a, a notion of what's called watermarking, which is this concept of basically estimated completeness. Watermark is a special value that flows through the, the data flow of the pipeline and tells all of the operators that we have seen all of the data, or we believe we've seen all the data from before a certain time. And that tells us if we have a, like a window that closes at, a, at time T and we get a watermark that is after T, that tells us that we can close that window, that we've seen all the data that will be in that window and we're able to process it and return the results to the user. Um, so this is a common pattern in certain types of stream processors like Flink and Arroyo. There's other approaches to this, which Arroyo and other systems like Materialize also support, which is a, based around a more incremental style of computation where we actually decide we're never going to be done. We never know that we have all the data for a particular time period. So every time an event comes in, we're going to update the state of that window and emit the new result there. So depending on the kind of problem, you may kind of want one style of SQL or the other style of SQL. But yeah, in any case, it's all, it's all SQL. You wrote an article called Rust is the best language for data infra, which is kind of a catchy title. And I read the article and, and one thing I wondered about was, okay, was Rust your first choice when you started? Have you looked into, for example, the solutions that came before you? And also, was it at around a time where SIG also became popular? And where do you see yourself in this space? Would you say, okay, Rust was just there at the right point in time? Or would you also say, well, there would be alternative realities, so to say, where Arroyo was written in C++ or maybe SIG in, yeah, in a different world? Yeah, so I mean, set, kind of setting this historically, the very earliest systems of this kind of in this space, like the the original Google systems that establish a lot of how we think about big data today, like MapReduce and Bigtable and and GFS, those were all written in C plus plus, and then we had a long history of writing systems in Java, like Hadoop and HBase, and Flink itself is written in well, originally Scala and then rewritten in Java. And then we had a whole period of doing Go with like CockroachDB and a handful of other big data systems. And yeah, I think now definitely we we would not have chosen Java or Go for for Arroyo. I, I think in many ways the current era of systems is a reaction to the previous era of writing these systems in Java. Um, a lot of people are finding that you can get much better performance, much easier operations literally just by rewriting these systems in in an, a non-managed language like C++ or, or Rust. So we're, we're kind of following in the footsteps of projects like Red Panda, which did this with Kafka, and SillaDB that did this with Cassandra. So I think like we, we could have done some of the, the things we're trying to do in Java or Go, but it would have been much harder to accomplish our goals. So in a world without Rust, I think we probably would have ended up choosing C++. But I'm I'm very grateful that we are in a world with Rust. It has definitely made our lives much easier than we, it would have been if we had had to choose C++ for this. Mm -hmm. Especially, I, I assume to optimize the platform, you would have to avoid a lot of copies. And in C++, passing references around can be a bit of a nightmare sometimes if you don't know exactly what you're doing and even if you do there can be issues with that and i, I just wondered do you have a lot of lifetimes in your code as well or is that something that the rust compiler completely elides and you don't even have to think about lifetimes at all so the the most like memory oriented or kind of like lifetime oriented part of our system is the storage layer so Maybe to give a little bit of architectural insight here, the way these systems look are they are these directed acyclic graphs of data flow. So you take a SQL statement 
you compile it into a SQL plan and then eventually optimize that into this data flow graph. Each node of this graph is some kind of potentially stateful operator. So for example, doing a filter or a map or a stateful function like a window or a join. And between these operators, the events and process data flow over queues or over network sockets. So within these stateful operators, we potentially have to store data for long periods of time. So if you imagine you have like a 30-day sliding window, we need to store some representation of that data for 30 days. And we do that in a mix of offline S3 storage and local disk cache and then in-memory cache. And managing that in-memory cache uh, brings into into issue these like lifetime concerns, managing the data as it kind of flows from that cache into the processor in order to, to be used. Fortunately, in, in, in these systems, the architecture constrains that problem somewhat. So at the semantic layer, you're kind of processing one event at a time in each of these in each of these operators. So you don't have to deal with really concurrency issues at the uh, kind of at the direct processing layer. Um, And that ends up simplifying the kind of lifetime management that you might have in a more traditional database where you're kind of dealing with a bunch of different requests to the same data. So in Rust Lingua, that would be your types are not sync or they don't have to be. That's correct. Yeah, we're we're always accessing a particular. Uh, you can think logically, each of these operators is single threaded. This is all implemented in Tokyo, so the what's happening under the hood is is much more complicated than that. But as a programmer, you can really think of it as synchronous processing on a single thread. Speaking of Tokyo, it feels like this is an ideal use case for it because you're kind of leaning into things that are inherently concurrent. They don't really have to be sequential. They can, at least parts of them can be executed concurrently, sometimes maybe even in parallel. But I wonder what you think about Tokyo, your experiences with the framework, the ergonomics of it, and also the recent discussion about async Rust being ascend, uh, sync, Mm -hmm. and so on, and, and work stealing, schedulers, all of that stuff. Yeah, so at a high level, a system like Arroyo doesn't really need a complex scheduler like Tokyo. As I mentioned, each of these operators essentially acts as a single thread. It receives one event, it does all the processing for that event, and then it sends it on to its next its next destination. And all this has to happen in order to uphold the like correctness guarantees of the system. But, and because of that, the first version of Arroyo actually was built around threads and, and thread processing. At some point, it migrated to Tokyo and async Rust, actually pretty early on. And the, the core reason for that was that so much of the ecosystem is in async Rust at this point, that if you want to use common network libraries or database drivers or almost anything from kind of network programming ecosystem, you do have to deal with async at some point. And at some point, it's easier just to move your whole system over to async. And that was definitely a challenging migration. Largely for me, I had never worked with async Rust before. So it involves a lot of learning, a lot of time on the Tokyo Discord channel, which is extremely helpful. But in the end, actually, the surprise was that it ended up being a lot faster. Just purely doing that migration made the system like 30% faster which was not my expectation at all. But it turns out that the Tokyo scheduler is really, really effective at this class of problems, where even though it it looks at a high level, like all this processing is single-threaded, there's a lot more going on under the hood, a lot more work that has to be coordinated between, like, you actually have threads, like, in our case, like, talking to S3 or talking to other systems. You have a lot of queues involved. So even though we have only a smallish number of like actual processing threads, there's a lot of network exchange happening on on other threads, talking to like the coordination system over gRPC. And Tokyo is really good at 
at you know organizing all of this work efficiently and and really maxing out the use of your core. I think that the most surprising thing for us is that we're able to run the system at extremely high utilization, like above 95% CPU utilization, and everything remains responsive and reactive and is able to to really work effectively at that extremely high level of of CPU thrash, which has never been my experience with the systems written in other paradigms. And then in terms of, I guess, kind of how I think about the async rust, I guess, drama, if we want to say that word, I think the Rust community has a higher level of drama in general, and I don't fully understand why that is. <laughs> but I think maybe the technology just works so well that we can't, you know, we sort of have to invent other stuff to be upset about. But I, I will say Async Rust definitely has a learning curve. It took me like a month coming from, from being like, a, I would say, a pretty strong Rust programmer already. It, it took maybe a month to really be an effective Async Rust programmer. And it's definitely been the edge of the system that other people who contribute it to it have the most trouble with this the requirement that that values passing over await be send definitely can be frustrating if you aren't experienced in the strategies for dealing with that and the sometimes bad error messages in the compiler don't help with that either it can make it really hard to figure out where exactly that problem is introduced in a large amount of code but I'd say overall, Tokyo has been a huge boon to us, and it, it's really remarkable what you know what it allows us to do in terms of just not having to think very much about how we schedule work. It, it just does a really remarkably good job on its own. Well, Rust protects you from memory or safety problems. It does not protect you from race conditions. So I wonder if you as someone that uses Rust and Tokyo at scale has run into any sort of data races or things that you encountered at runtime, which maybe were a bit of an issue for your platform, or did you never ever have any outages in production? <laughs> so not specifically from race conditions, which again, like the architecture of the, this, of, of our system makes the high level concurrency pretty straightforward the although a lot more complexity creeps in in the details especially when you try to get to the like that next level of performance so for example like the the storage system is extremely complex and has a lot of concurrency but rust does does really help a lot with managing that that complexity in terms of like issues in production the the issues we've seen are are much more, more around like the high level like the the ways that all the different pieces of this this distributed system interact with each other and about like wrong assumptions in different pieces about what other things are doing which unfortunately rust definitely does not fix distributed systems issues but in in terms of like the kind of micro level it's remarkable how well things work once you get them to compile an example I, I brought up in that blog post, but still kind of blows my mind, is that I wrote the entire network stack, like the the piece of software that allows this system to be distributed. I wrote that in like a two day push, basically like two twelve hour days, and basically just coded that straight, and then at the end spent maybe an hour trying to get it to compile, and from there it it just worked perfectly the very first time i made a single node system a distributed system without any testing any any iteration on that and it basically hasn't changed since that that initial Im implementation and i've definitely never experienced that writing network software in c++ or or even java for that matter that's pretty impressive yes pretty awesome that you could pull that off and it's a testament to the Rust type system, which is helpful, and also the borrow checker and all of the things that make Rust development and the developer ergonomics pretty awesome. I wondered, though, although maybe you didn't have that many runtime problems, I wondered if you had any compile time problems in the sense that maybe parts of the ecosystem were not aligned, like compatibility issues with, say, different versions of Tokyo or maybe different libraries that were uh, 
sometimes more mature, sometimes less. Yeah, it's never been a huge issue. And just the the Rust Crate ecosystem in general has been such a boon to us from a productivity perspective compared like to the C++ world where using dependencies is so challenging and, and you don't have this incredible rich ecosystem that we already have in Rust after such you know, a relatively small amount of time. So there are occasional compatibility issues. We've had to fork a few open source projects we rely on, but I would say it's a very small part of my day dealing with any of that stuff. All of the things that you mentioned are, at least to an average developer, pretty low level, or at least you need a lot of expertise on how to structure such systems or architect such systems in order to perform well and i wondered what do you think how much does rust guide you towards an idiomatic solution and what is your own expertise yeah i think rust definitely guides you towards a correct solution i don't know it always helps you that much with like being idiomatic although the tooling around it is very helpful like cargo clippy is really helpful and was very helpful. So my co-founder had never used Rust before working on this project. He's a, a really experienced distributed systems engineer and has worked on a bunch of query systems, but was new to Rust. And tools like Clippy really helped him like pick up the idiomatic style of Rust pretty quickly. But yeah, beyond that, I think the Rust community is also really helpful. I mentioned already the Tokyo Discord, which was was super useful when I was trying to get up to speed with async Rust. But in general, like the the Rust community is is extremely useful in in helping you solve problems or figure out why some weird compile issue is happening. Did you use any resources outside of the official Rust book and maybe the community to help you get started with Rust? Or did you start on a project and learn on the job? So I've actually been using Rust since uh, like 2014. I've never convinced a company we should do like a major project in Rust until now. It was always a big uphill battle trying to introduce Rust into a large organization. But I've been using it for all of my kind of like personal projects for a really long time. I've I've been a fan of the language since basically I first learned about it. So in terms of my own development, there's been a lot of resources like over that time. The first version of the Rust book, which actually I have on my bookshelf back there, that was very helpful. But also it just changed so much in the early days that it it was a full-time job just kind of keeping track of the updates to the language. Today, it's much easier. It's uh, It's been pretty stable for a number of years. And I think the quality and quantity of resources has also increased a lot. I know there's a, a really good book actually on Rust in production that I've, I've looked at a fair bit for the more kind of how do you actually run Rust details? Like what, what does re- logging look like in Rust? What does, how do we do metrics? Like these, these kinds of, of things that aren't necessarily like part of the intro. To, what to book is that? It's, I think it's called Rust in Production. Um, ah, by Luca Palmieri. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And you mentioned that it's a bit tricky sometimes to convince bigger companies and organizations to move towards Rust and introduce Rust at these companies. Why is that in your experience? Yeah, I think large companies tend not to be that ambitious in their technical choices. A lot of it is is built around minimizing risk rather than like maximizing reward. And Rust definitely seems risky to like a CTO today. Like they worry hmm. will it be too hard for engineers to learn how to do Rust. Will be will will we be able to if we like restructure teams, will we be able to pass off this project to another team? Will they have to figure out how to to use it? Will we be able to hire enough Rust engineers? And if you're you know, if you're Google and you need to hire 10,000 engineers, I think you should be rightly concerned about hiring 10,000 Rust engineers. I doubt there are that many Rust engineers in the world. But for a smaller company, that's not an issue at all, right? Hiring three Rust engineers is pretty easy. And I think especially for a small company, it's an advantage in a way that it maybe isn't for a big company to be using Rust. Because as a small company you can attract people because they want to work in Rust. And that, that's a big incentive to, to work for you. And I think that's 
yeah, working in like maybe a slightly obscure language, you, you get those people who are really excited about it. And that can be a, a big boon to you. But for yeah, big companies, they they kind of just see the risk side of that equation. How do you hire Rust engineers? Do you reach out in your network or do you post job announcements somewhere? Yeah, well, I guess actually for us initially, we've been hiring more on the streaming expertise side. There's actually, there's maybe more overlap there now than there was maybe two years ago. A lot of the newer streaming systems are also in Rust. But historically, as I mentioned, streaming systems have been largely in, in Java. So that's where most people have expertise. But I definitely anticipate as we try to hire more broadly that hiring from that pool of Rust engineers will, will be pretty productive, especially as a like non-cryptocurrency Rust company. There's, I think, a lot of demand for those jobs right now. So we'll, we'll be able to tap into that. Very true. What sort of other crates do you use to get job, your job done? I guess in the blog post, you mentioned data fusion. Maybe mm -hmm. that's one that you can talk about, but feel free also to talk about any other crate that you like. Yeah, so data fusion is probably like the most critical one to us. Data fusion is a number of things. This comes from the Aero RS ecosystem. We use it primarily as a SQL parser. So it takes SQL text and turns it into an AST and then planner. So taking that AST and turning it into a graph-oriented plan that describes what that SQL is supposed to do. SQL is an extremely complex language with like 30 years of history and a bunch of different equivalent ways to express stuff. So having a library that deals with a lot of that complexity for you is extremely helpful when you're building a SQL engine. We get a nice clean plan out of that that we're able to then optimize in our own way and compile into our own set of operators. So that data fusion has been extremely critical to us being able to, to build this thing as quickly as we have. Beyond that, I guess I'll, I'll also call out maybe a little bit lower level or higher level, but really appreciate the actually Rust web ecosystem. So we rely on Axum and SQL X, which is a really great SQL library. This is not like the core of our product at all. Uh, this is like to power our, our API and our web interface. But it's remarkable that even a domain that maybe Rust isn't natively as well suited to, we still have these incredibly high quality libraries that make it actually really easy to, to build good products in that domain. So that's that's been a, an impressive discovery for us. The grades that you mentioned, I cannot speak about data fusion, but definitely the other ones are top of class in any language, literally, I would say. At least from my experience, I used Axum and SQLX before, and I think they are really awesome. But I wonder about the future of this ecosystem. Do you see that we kind of reached a point where crates are starting to more or less stabilize and there's one go-to crate that you pick for your job? Or would you say the ecosystem is still so young that I can see myself switching, let's say, to a different web framework in a year or maybe a different parser or whatever if it comes up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably too early to say that things have stabilized. Like a year ago, your choices in a lot of these areas would have been different. Definitely three years ago, these none of these crates existed Axum itself is still changing <laughs> quite a lot from release to release. So I, I think even these crates have not directly stabilized. But I think we, we will be hitting more of a period of stability, especially with async Rust becoming more feature complete. A lot of these libraries have had to work around limitations in the async e ecosystem and implementation, like missing the ability to use async functions and traits. Um, which is just has just landed or is about to land. Um, In 174, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that will allow things to stabilize their APIs in a way that has been challenging so far. Um, and, I, and I do expect more kind of stability going forward and more obvious choices around which crate we use to solve different problems. And something that's been impressive to me about the Rust ecosystem is that 
there maybe were opportunities to stabilize earlier. Just to give you a random example for logging, we had the log crate that was like the obvious crate for a long time to use for logging. And we could have just decided that was good enough, but actually it turns out there was a better option and a better design. And we ended up with the tracing crate instead. And the ecosystem was able to move to kind of like this better option rather than getting bogged down in kind of like a local optimum. And you've seen this in a lot of different areas where like there was like an early consensus around a crate as the solution to this class of problems. But the ecosystem was able to move on to something that solved it better. Um, and I think that that's not a property you have in all ecosystems. And it's something I really appreciate about the Rust community. We're able to move fairly quickly and also in a pretty consensus-driven way to better options in the ecosystem. So I, I expect we'll continue to see that happening. I don't know if Axum, for example, is like the the end term of like Rust web programming. I, I think we'll continue to see iteration. What about Rust itself, the standard library? What about stabilization of the Rust core? Would you say this is already in a very satisfactory state or would you say that for your use case, there would be things that you would wish for? Mm -hmm. And I think everyone has their own wish list of RFCs that would we, we would hope finally get merged. I, I think for me personally, the lack of completeness around async has been the biggest frustration, like missing async functions and traits, for example, has required a lot of somewhat ugly workarounds for us. And even the, the version of this that's going to be stabilized isn't quite complete enough for all of our use cases. Uh, but I appreciate that Rust takes time to get these solutions right. And I, I think we've seen that process play out with async Overall, I think the Rust programming language is in a really good place. And I think, well, you know, it, it has stabilized over the past couple of years compared to like the previous five years. And we'll continue to see that stabilization um, with hopefully a few nice improvements, like the, the work we're getting out of like GADTs or the, the improvements to async we're seeing right now. I fully agree. Where I see some issues is on the edges of the Rust standard library. So where you talk to other languages with FFI or where you load code dynamically. And I guess for a streaming platform, that is also an interesting use case, maybe where you can hook stuff into your engine at runtime. And of course, there are technologies like WebAssembly and that sort of stuff getting pushed forward. I wonder if you already experimented with that and what's your impression on the current state of the ecosystem around that? Yeah, actually, maybe I, I should have called that out. I, I called that out in my blog post as a frustration. Uh, Rust does not have a stable ABI, application binary interface, which is, is challenging if you're trying to build anything that looks like a plug-in system. So if you want to compile, like in our case, we support user-defined functions. So users can write Rust code that then gets loaded into the engine at runtime. If we were writing this in C or C++, there's a stable C ABI that you're able to use to basically dynamically link software at runtime. Rust doesn't have this. So if you want to compile a library and a host application and link them, you have to do that with the exact same version of the Rust compiler. And in many cases, like the same settings for those compilers. So it makes it really hard to like distribute basically binary software separately from the thing that is consuming that, that library. So today, the solution you basically have to use is to use the C ABI, which is means giving up a lot of like the features and power of Rust, at least at your interfaces. You also mentioned WASM, which is another class of solutions to this problem. Uh, in some ways, this is even worse from like interface perspective because there's no real standard way to interact between like hosts and plugins in the Wasm ecosystem. So every application sort of has to figure this out for themselves. Um, we have explored Wasm as a solution to, to kind of this class of problems. We actually have an integration with Wasm time, which is a, a great Rust Wasm runtime. And I think for systems like ours, that probably will be the direction that, that we take going forward. 
particularly great for integrating with other language ecosystems. And there's a lot of energy in the Wasm world to kind of figure out these integration problems, like how how does a Rust program talk to a Python program over shared Wasm memory? How how can we build these kind of like unified interfaces that mean that individual projects like ours don't have to keep solving this class of problems over and over again? But it would be really nice if Rust were better at, at this kind of interacting dynamically with other compiled code. Are you aware of any RFCs that propose the stabilization of the Rust ABI? Yeah, there there are a couple RFCs in this area um, with different approaches, but I, I haven't seen a lot of progress in the past couple of years or, or real interest in solving this problem. I, I think it is somewhat niche. Most Rust code is distributed as as source, or most Rust projects are distributed as source code. Most libraries are compiled in at build time, but for projects like ours or anything that's kind of dealing with plugin ecosystems, yeah, that's, that's not really good enough. I guess we covered a lot of the technicalities of the project. I also wanted to touch on a few things that were a bit more business related. I guess the first question I had along these lines would be a very respect by Y Combinator, as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. Did investors ever care about your choice of programming language or was it never for debate? Or maybe it was even a good thing and maybe they encouraged you to use Rust. Yeah, I would say Rust has only helped us talking to investors. There are a number of systems that have come before us that have proved Rust can work commercially. Investors know it's like the hot language in, in the data space. And so you definitely seem more attractive in that sense to if, if you're using Rust. But honestly, most investors do not care about your language choice. That's just not the level that they operate on. And if you come in as an expert in this area and you say, like, I think this is the right technical choice, investors are not going to second guess you on that. They're much more interested on the like commercial side of the question. How are you going to sell this? Who are your users? You know, why, why are they going to choose you over a more established company in this space? They're definitely not grilling you about like, why are you using Tokyo or async AO or IO or, or whatever? Yeah. What would you recommend to people that are in the same space and are considering to use Rust? Maybe they dabbled into it, but they are not sure if they should fully commit to it for their next project. Yeah, well, I, I think in this space, Rust is, is just the obvious choice today. It's, you know, we went through this whole era of building these systems in, in Java or Go or whatever, but today, especially in the current like macroeconomic environment, companies are much more cost conscious. And when you can write something in Rust that takes half the resources or a quarter of the resources of the, the Java version of it, that's a huge, huge selling point. It's really hard to compete with these much slower Java systems. And I mean, the, the Java systems are responding by like rewriting core pieces in like C++. Like we saw Spark rewrote their core engine in C++. Confluent, the, the Kafka people have been rewriting stuff as well. So I, I think it's just really hard to compete if you're not in either C++ or Rust. And I, I think you're going to find, even though there's maybe a larger pool of C++ developers today, it's much easier to teach someone to become a good Rust programmer than to teach them to be a good C++ programmer. And the, the Rust compiler helps you so much with people who aren't really experienced dealing with like memory management It makes it much harder to to make this these classes of mistakes. So I, I think I think it is very much like the the obvious choice. You know, maybe there's some newer languages that you could explore. You mentioned Zig earlier, but all these kind of like new, I guess, Rust replacements are so much less mature today that you really would have to be very ambitious to to like experiment with that. So yeah, so I think. Either C++ or Rust, and, and really, unless you have a strong reason to use C++, I think Rust is just the default choice today. Taking the example of Confluent, they took parts of their code base and rewrote it in C++ 
if I understood correctly. And I wonder why they chose C++ instead of Rust, because maybe that's already a very mature alternative. Why didn't they pick Rust then? Or was it before Rust even became that mature? Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll speak of like Spark. I maybe have a little more background on. But yeah, so Spark historically was written in Scala and then mostly written in Java. And then Databricks rewrote their core engine in C++. And that's, that's something that they've kept closed source. I think it was just this project started like six years ago when Rust was much less mature than it is today. Do you know of any other companies that are currently planning to rewrite parts of their code base in Rust in, its, in that space? Well, yeah, a great example is InfluxDB, which was originally written in Go, or actually, sorry, I think originally in Java, then they rewrote in Go, um, and have just completed a major rewrite of their core storage engine in Rust. And actually, that we've, we've been benefiting a lot from that because they're big supporters of DataFusion and the Arrow project. TIKV, actually not exactly sure how you say that, another example where they started in Go and rewrote their core engine in Rust. So that's, I think, been a pretty common trend in the recent years. If you're curious about InfluxDB's usage of Rust, then you should check out episode number one, <laughs> where we had Paul Nix on the show. And yeah, he talks a lot about the reasoning for InfluxDB moving to Rust. And I think this wasn't planned, but it's a nice segue into promoting this other episode if people are interested. Very interesting. I think looking forward, maybe in the next three, four, five years, and looking at the projects that might get started along the way and the things that are existing and are evolving over time, what is your perspective what is your vision for the future where do you see the industry move yeah i i, I definitely see yeah I, f i feel like i'm a broken record but like i think for people starting new data systems or new like large-scale systems most people are going to choose rust going forward there's still people starting new c++ systems but just looking in my own space three quarters of the new systems are Rust and one quarter of them are in, are in C++. And I think that trend is going to only increase as Rust becomes less risky from a technical perspective and from a hiring perspective. I mean, you know, maybe we'll see disruption from these other newer languages that are able to, to become more mature and start attracting projects. At some point, I'm sure Rust will become boring and people will, will want to want to use more exciting languages. But that would be, I think, an extremely successful outcome for the Rust project. For now, we, we have not regretted our, our technical choice at all. We're about a, a little over a year into this, and Rust is, has proved an extremely successful technology choice. I, I think maybe an interesting question is how much Rust adoption happens in the more application space. So there's kind of a divide here between infrastructural software and application software. So infrastructure software, like the stuff we're working on, or a database, for example, is, is something that's written by a, a small team and then run by a much larger group of people. So it definitely, it makes sense to put a lot of effort into making it really efficient and fast because it's going to run on so many CPU cores over its lifetime. For application software, where like the the development costs are much closer, maybe to, or much greater than like the runtime costs, um, you don't necessarily have that same financial pressure to make it really efficient. And today, I think Rust is a much harder sell in that that space because the the additional complexity of writing stuff in Rust and additional like difficulty, you know, hiring Rust engineers or, or training people in Rust. So I wonder, you know, how much Rust will kind of grow in that space through just more maturity in the, the language and ecosystem and maybe a growing set of like people who use Rust or want to use Rust. But to me, that's like a big open kind of area for a language to expand or, or a new language to come and move into that, that space. Because 
I think we can do better than Java and Go for for kind of application level programming. And there's so much of the ergonomics of Rust that are, are great for that, but dealing with some of the the sharper corners of Rust around the the memory management and lifetime issues, where it just feels like if you don't care that much about performance, you shouldn't need to to kind of deal with this for for that class of problems. If you look at a related field like data science, it feels like they are also starting to experiment with some ideas from the Rust world, if not even rewrite parts of their libraries in Rust to use it in more, in less performant, higher level languages like Python. You have Parquet files and then you have parsers around that and, and you have pandas and all of this is inherently an interesting space for Rust because it's a mixture between analysis where performance is also relevant, right? Do you do you agree in general? Yeah, so I, I think that that's definitely a term that will continue. And this is really uh, taking a Rust core and wrapping it in a higher level language like Python. And that's been really, really successful. We see that in the Java ecosystem as well, where a lot of these Java tools have rewritten their cores in Rust and gotten 10x or, or more performance out of that. I... I'm not personally a Python person, but people obviously really love it, and it's very hard to convince data scientists to use anything besides Python. So, if you do want to give them better performance, I think you know this approach of like writing the core in Rust and and wrapping it in your higher level language is something that that has been really successful. I guess the the other fascinating approach. I don't know if you're familiar with Mojo. This is Chris no. Latner's new language, the the creator of Swift. Mm-hmm. This is creating like a Python-like language that actually compiles into LLVM and MLIR and aims to provide like C++ performance with Python, somewhat Python compatibility. And that to me it, it is extremely ambitious given the kind of semantics of Python and how hard that is to optimize but like if you don't want to to kind of take this rust approach like that's the only other way you can really get acceptable performance with with these python apis so for us we're since we're starting with sql you really it's very easy to optimize sql into whatever you know implementation you want and that that gives us a lot of advantages for providing really really high performance because sql is kind of declarative you're able to rewrite the expressions in ways that make it much faster to actually execute. But when you have something like Python, you're much more limited in, in how much you can really optimize that, even with a, a Rust core. So I think it'll be interesting to see like how data science, as our data volumes increase and the complexity of the processing we're doing increases, how that will kind of financial pressures will push people into higher performance paradigms. But yeah, for now, I think the Polar's approach of, of kind of the REST core is something we'll see in, in a lot of these data science ecosystems. Yeah, I agree. I think we're getting towards the end and it has been somewhat a tradition around here to ask this final question to people. If there was one thing that you could say to the REST community as a whole, like one of a statement, a message that you have to the community, what would it be? I think my my message to the Rust community would be like chill out a little bit. Rust is an incredible language, an incredible ecosystem and community. And yet we seem to have 10 times the drama of any other language community I've been part of. And I, I don't really understand why or where it all comes from, but I think that that level of drama can only hurt adoption when people look at the rust reddit and are like this is a shit show why would i want to be part of this so yeah i I think hopefully we can look back at like the past year and just say like we all just need to like calm down a little bit and you know figure out how to work with everyone else and uh, stop driving people out of the community that's a great final statement really love it Michael, it has been a pleasure to have you on the show. Where can people learn more about you, about Arroyo? How can they get started with the platform? 
Yeah. Um, so I think we have some pretty good docs. If you head to our website, arroyo.dev, we, we link to those there. Uh, we have a Docker image, super easy to run it and play around, get a nice web UI where you can write SQL, you can talk to like WebSocket APIs and HTTP APIs, and it's easy to play around with publicly available streaming data. And then we have a really friendly Discord community. So if you head to our website, we have a link to that and, and you can join. You heard it. There's nothing more to say. Again, thanks a lot, Micah, for coming into the show. And yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. Rust in Production is a podcast by Corrode and hosted by me, Matthias Endler. For show notes, transcripts, and to learn more about how I can help your company make the most of Rust, visit corrode.dev. Thanks for listening to Rust in Production.